as a grower, I probably don't directly export myself. I'd go through an agent and a packer, but Elliot's put more first hand. Yeah, it's a it's a challenge because what we've seen in the um, the industry is that the demand has increased um, much greater than the the industry has been able to keep up with supply in the last few years. Um, which is causing price inflation, which is a good thing in terms of um, economic contribution to the to the areas that we grow in and uh, investment and uh, and the like. But it does create a short term issue around um, customers who are used to paying and consumers who are used to paying certain prices, who are now um, tested around their um, loyalty to that product. Um, so we, we very much, I guess, are engaged with all of our customer relationships and we like to think that we do see uh, the trend um, coming and uh, signal it early enough um, to be able to uh, let them to plan accordingly. Um, but at the end of the day, there has been uh, an impact on the volume that we now sell in the domestic market versus the export market. Uh, so we're now circa 72% of our products exported, whereas five, six years ago we were exporting about 45%. So, um, you know, the, uh, some of that gets backfilled by other suppliers into the domestic market. Some is just, as an overall industry, is, is increasing the percentage, which is um, uh, resulting in a price increase and, 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 I guess, using market forces to, to drive that. Uh, my name is Han. I'm from Northern Territory. I'm a horticulturalist <coughs> or a fruit farmer. Just kind of directed at Caroline, but probably to all of them eventually. Um, you showed diagrams for export to China uh, was 39%. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that, first of all, question is Hong Kong included in that data or was that excluded? Uh, that excludes Hong Kong. We treat Hong Kong separately, so there okay. would be redirection through Hong Kong yeah. to China. Yes. So, so how much would the redirection of those fruit through Hong Kong or previously through Vietnam into China, would that percentage have changed a fair bit? And you know, would I, I, don't, I don't know that percentage, but I can definitely get it for you. Um, even during the course of this conference, if that interests you, we can get that. Okay, just, just yeah. thought I'd ask, because yeah, whether it's a big factor of, of those... Secondary chain yep. entry is actually a big factor of, yep. you know, whether right. it actually moves the, the, the percentage up and down a bit. Yeah, you would be right there. We've got another question. Liam from Go Farm Australia. Question to Elliot. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed Ian Proud Proudfoot's presentation this morning, earlier today. Um, looking at the future, and he was talking about um, the trend towards alternative, local, organic, natural, warm, fuzzy growers, small cottage um, type, type image. You're obviously a corporate grower, albeit a very successful one, closely aligned with, the, with Coles and Woolies domestically. How do you face that challenge and, uh, and how do you position yourself to be that friendly faced <laughs> or, or represent yourself that way anyway. Yeah. Well, we typically don't wear suits to work every day, that's for sure. So uh, um, I think the, uh, it is, it is a, a challenge of, um, you know, as, as a corporate company, that's, its roots are still very much in a family business. So I've worked for the company for 16 years and the culture of the organisation, I guess, is very much still the family company that's grown into a, into a you know, ASX 200 business and trying to um, retain the, all those elements of the... Of the um, family farming operation, uh, but with the scale and uh, ability to scale up that the corp, being a corporate provides. Um, I think the you know my general view about the the, the domestic market, particularly, uh, well, firstly, export markets. It, it's largely around fulfilment at the moment, so they're all looking for. They, there's a huge demand, um, cannot fill the demand, so. Um, they want to work with suppliers who have uh, that full range of product, large scale to be able to support those programs and do it you know, from, from a f food safety point of view and um, investment point of view. The domestic market I don't think is too much different. Um, what they, the feedback we get from you know, the Woolworths, Coles and Aldi and the like is what they love about Costa is our ability now to invest. So we're investing significant amounts of money in the industry our own production um, and innovation and the like, which is all about growing the category for them, ultimately. And um, they don't seem to be too concerned about um, the fact that we 
with that comes that part of that corporate image. Yeah. So we work with um, we have a uh, we we have a presence in the online space as well. So there are um, direct online businesses, home delivery businesses that we've supplied and still supply both in Australia and overseas. Um, we haven't gone down the path that Ryan has around that direct marketing and, and from a management, so we tend to be the, the sort of the supplier behind the supplier uh, through our wholesaling um, business, that, through our network. That, um, and I guess the view we've had is that um, you know, we've focused on what we believe is uh, our core competencies and, and leave that part of the business. But we have a, a watch fly on it, and if, if it's a space that we believe is going to be where the future is, naturally we're going to look to invest uh, and we'll be part of that. Um, Bridget Murray from Innovac Consulting. Apologies for my voice. Um, so my question's for Ryan. You mentioned that when it comes to brand awareness, um, it can't just be the responsibility of the individual farmers. It needs to at some point come from an industry level. Mm -hmm. So I guess I was wondering, in terms of industry bodies, where you think their responsibilities really lie in, is it they need to make more product awareness or does there need to be more of a national brand awareness? Um, I think from the citrus industry, we've got a, we've got a fairly good national body um, and I think from our perspective that having that national body, I suppose, directing um, the values of the industry is, is important and then I suppose that helps align that information flow from the grower right through to the market. So, yeah, I think that's important. I don't... I've pretty lost the question a little bit, sorry. So, oh, so I, was, I guess I was just wondering where you think the industry, the national industry bodies play the most important role when it comes to um, brand recognition. Or I just product. think they know it's just everyone has to be part of the process and I suppose as the national bodies they probably need to facilitate it just to make sure that it's within the, indus, in, the interest of the industry um, and you can't hurt um, I suppose the industry as a whole with making sure that the store, everyone's singing from the same song sheet I suppose with the story going through? Well, I think my view would be that the, the, the retailer tend to be the real arbiters of the, uh, the, the quality, so their standards that we're compliant with uh, around where they set those, and they're in line with the industry's recommendations and the science that sits behind that. California generally is regarded as probably the best citrus growing area in the world for high bricks and sugar levels, and it may be yeah, as a consumer myself, I often find that you know, California product is, is very good. Uh, that's the market, feedback we get from a lot of the export markets we're in as well, that the sugar levels can often be half a bricks or one bricks higher uh, than Australia, but then Australia will be higher than South Africa and Peru and Chile, and sort of that's how it tends to work. So it may be nothing more than just the climatic conditions of those areas you're growing in, I think. Mm. Probably from a citrus industry's perspective, that's very much how we work. Um, I suppose in the Riverland there's three or four major pack houses and I'm not sure exactly on growers but there might be 100, 150 growers and we'll export through um, four major pack houses. Um, and, and that just brings efficiency in marketing, um, supply chain logistics. It also helps you pull your produce so you can supply different segments of the market. Um, and I suppose it's it's a, it's maybe that's an opportunity for you guys. Um, for us, that's how we that's how we've done business for years. Um, and then I suppose our business selling online direct was to try and I suppose take some of those middle steps and middlemen out of it. Uh, I suppose what we found is everyone in between does a job, and while you can take that on, it's a cost and a time factor. Um, and unless you're delivering a significantly different product at the end, um, it's it's probably you're probably better off pulling your produce as a cooperative or a group through a, through a sort of a more concentrated, focused body to do it. Mm. Yep. Thanks, David. Ben Van Delden from KPMG. Uh, question for Elliot. I'm really interested in the Japanese market that you talked a lot about. And, you know, when we associate Japan as a market, it's a mature and tech-enabled market. You talked a lot about their taste preferences around bricks and acidity. 
Where do you see us as an industry moving to around using technology to really validate the difference between Australian citrus at a bricks and acidity level um, through the supply chain right through to the consumer? Is, is, is that something in the near future for us? So I think uh, certainly the Japanese um, importers uh, will uh, test every consignment on uh, receival and uh, provide that feedback and they'll have to, um, when they're, the programs that they're setting up with the retailers, uh, it's all on the basis of an expectation of what that BRICS level is going to be and then in order to fulfil that program we have to have met that level. The, from a tech point of view there's potential I think um, because it can still be, you know, for us it's all done at the packing shed level or it's in field in terms of what um, um, what patches we'll pick at certain times. Um, and then um, there are also then some innovation around how you can really look to increase your BRICS level uh, without compromising the quality of the product or the health of the tree um, to, to uh, have a higher percentage of your crop fall within that. So there is definitely... Um, a lot more data and analytics now within that um, upstream process from uh, really through the irrigation cycle of through the summer, uh, a lot more science and work being done now about how to uh, induce higher sugar and how to um, have a higher percentage of your total yield meeting that spec. Um, I think the uh, very much we, you go into a store in Japan and they'll call out the bricks level at the point of sale as well as the the um, fungicides that have been used to treat the product and the like. So, the uh, again, getting back to that point about the consumers are far more... Their expectations are much greater around being um, informed. Um, so, you know, there's definitely applications all through the supply chain of doing it, but um, I think where we're focusing mainly at the moment is around how do we increase the percentage of our crop that meets that spec and what data, technology can we... and innovation can we use to, to achieve that. Robbie Davis, Potatoes South Australia. Thank you, David. Um, if we think about Brand Australia and its reputation, which is built on quality, safety, consistency of supply, um, and this really is a question for you, Elliot, um, what are you doing in the Costa Group concerning things like food fraud and product substitution in a market like China? It's a good question, because it's uh, prevalent from our um, uh, insights, I guess. Um, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, we have a, a, an answer to that that would be uh, bulletproof or considered to be uh, any revelation. I think we're like everybody else who are dealing with that. Um, it's really largely about trying to work with partners that we think uh, have our interests at, at, uh, at heart as well and aligning ourselves with people that um, are going to bring that to our attention. Um, it's a... Um, in terms of registering trademarks around um, brands um, and the like is an, an evolving um, area. So we're also a, a significant grower in China of uh, berries, which we sell under the Driscoll's brand uh, through the China market. And uh, we have both registered our um, IP around our berry varieties as well as the brand. And uh, well, Driscoll's have registered the brand, I should say, as our uh, partner up there. Um, and that's probably the IP around the varieties is of greater concern to us than even the brand around the um, leakage of that and uh, you know legal propagation and the like. And it's a, I, I think it's evolving. So we the the the, the advice we get is that the, the government want to clamp down and that they want to they do not want to allow this because they see it as a constraint to the development of those markets. Um, but it's not a um, you know, we, we don't have many examples ourselves of where our product has been, um, where that's happened to us with the product we've shipped from Australia, uh, but I'm certainly aware of many cases of it. Um, but the information we get is they are clamping down on it. So, We all know that an exchange rate fluctuates. That's a given. We start at that point. An exchange rate will, of course, make our commodity less price competitive. But when we aren't competing on price to begin with for some of these products, these horticultural products that we're exporting, then really for the kinds of changes that we're seeing in the exchange rate, which are relatively small year on year, it affects the returns to growers most, de most definitely. And there's a certain point where if we aren't price competitive, demand might suffer a bit in our export markets. But if that's not why 
people are demanding, our customers abroad are demanding our product, that it's not going to affect demand as significantly as you might think. As Elliot has said, there is a supply deficiency in our export markets. They're clamoring for high quality product. They're clamoring for the kinds of products that this country sells. And they'll pay for those products based on a number of criteria apart from price. So if there were a huge change in the exchange rate, then yes, you could say it, would, it, it could really detrimentally affect demand for our products, but that's not typically what we see. And we do have, as I mentioned, an industry that has set itself up to know what its customers want, and it's delivering that product. And it's not the lowest cost product or lowest price product. It's at a higher price point that is in a strong demand. So if I look at, uh, let's look at products where that is the case. So Chile uh, have access with table grapes into Australia uh, under a protocol that is probably still constraining around the, the success of landing product on you know, Sydney or Melbourne port uh, in spec. Um, and they have chosen not to advance that for obviously they figure they can service other world markets better. But that was a real challenge we were confronted with about eight well, nine years ago when that access was granted and we saw that as a, um, a, as a real threat. Um, it, it's, obviously, it's hypothetical. We would, uh, I, I think our view of the world would be that we're clearly focused around, like, we would address the Australian market much like we do the Japanese market, Chinese market, American market, where we compete with Chile, Peru, South Africa all day long. You have to find your point of difference, you have to find your relevance, uh, and you've got to build... Uh, in a more, you've got to build your business in a more competitive market. So um, you know, I think we would apply the same principles of how we operate in those uh, export markets. 